on just to deal with uh, some of the things we're talking about this evening. So on your way in uh, this evening, you should have received a handout. If you did not get a handout that's uh, stapled together there, make sure that you get one of those so that you can follow along with us. And tonight, we're going to explore some dangers that can keep us from perceiving spiritual truth that can stop us from growing spiritually, and that can keep us from flowing in the Holy Spirit. How many of you know we need to talk sometimes about some things that God has forbidden us to do? That's what we're going to look at tonight. We don't like to focus on things that are negative and dreary, but the Bible says that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So not only do we need to know what pleases the Lord, but what displeases Him as well. You know, if you cook for your spouse, it's not enough to know what their favorite meal is. You better know what they really hate to eat also. Amen? So let's see tonight how we can avoid spiritual dangers and get victory over them and walk in a way that's pleasing to God. It's really not possible in the short time we have tonight to give you an exhaustive study and all the topics we might mention. So uh, we want to offer several things to you. We can send you uh, my complete notes for this talk. We also have an audio copy, as we usually do, of this talk available online, and you can download it. I think we're also going to have it on uh, YouTube for you. We also have a sheet in the back of the room uh, that you can use, that you can grab on your way out tonight, that you can uh, get back to us at the church office in confidence, and we'll try to get you information on topics that you may have questions about, even if we don't talk about them tonight. So you can find all that stuff on our website if you go to htchurch.com slash fresh look. So it would be fresh dash look, htchurch.com slash fresh dash look. We also have a a book for you tonight, uh, which we haven't offered yet in the course, uh, and we highly encourage you to pick that up tonight. It's a book by Chuck Pierce, and it's called Protecting Your Home from spiritual darkness, protecting your home from spiritual darkness. We have a bunch of them available at the table in the back. That's a great resource and it will give you tremendous insight and get you some uh, help into some of these things, uh, help for some of these things. Now, um, even if you don't have the money uh, to pay for this book tonight, it's $10. So even if you don't have the cash on hand to grab this book tonight, Please make sure you take it anyway, and uh, you can uh, get us uh, the money next week. So let's, let's dive in tonight. Let's start to examine the issue. Let's talk about the issue. What is the issue? Uh, The issue is this, that in his word, God forbids his people to do certain things. He forbids us to commit idolatry, to engage in certain sexual practices, to contact supernatural beings who don't obey God, and to use supernatural power or knowledge which is not from God. And God forbids these practices for several reasons. First, God is a jealous God. He's a jealous God. What does it mean to say that God is jealous for us? Well, human jealousy is ugly, right? But God has a holy jealousy that's part of his love. He doesn't want us to get away from him. He wants the best for us without harming us. And his jealousy is the passion that he has for you to belong to him alone. He wants us to walk in his plan because he knows that will give us a better future. Second, God knows that the things that he forbids hurt us. They can cause damage in our lives. It could be physical, emotional, or spiritual. And third, God knows that these things expose us to the risk of demonization. That means that some things that we do can allow demonic spirits to get a foothold in our lives. If we persist in doing those things, then before long, a spiritual stronghold will be created in our lives. That means that the enemy's demons will have created a secure position in our lives from which they can steer our thinking and steer our behavior. In some cases, the person may no longer be able to free himself from the demonic influence and may need the help of the ministry of deliverance in order to be set free from the grip of the enemy. Folks, God loves us, and he wants us, of course, to walk free from all demonic influences. So tonight, through what we will call the four R's, we can experience God's freedom and cleansing from demonic influence. So tonight, we're going to pray for revelation. We're going to pray that the Holy Spirit will show us the enemy's door, any doorway that the enemy has into our lives. We're going to pray in repentance 
And that means we're going to turn away from things in our lives that have perhaps offended God. We're going to pray prayers of renunciation. That means we're going to renounce the things that have created a door for the enemy. That means that we verbally declare that we reject something and instead we make a proclamation against it. There is power in making those declarations in the name of Jesus. And we're going to pray to receive. We're going to pray to obtain grace from the Lord to walk in victory over those things and not return to them. So this process is designed to not only take back ground that the enemy might have gained in your life, but in order to close those doors to him coming back into your life. So um, before we launch into the teach, that's all in by way of introduction. So before we launch into the teaching, let's just bow our hearts and let's just pray and ask the Holy Spirit's help tonight as we look into the teaching. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Holy Spirit. We welcome you to come. We welcome you in this place. We confess with our mouths that Jesus is Lord. And we do declare that Jesus reigns in this place. And because Jesus reigns, freedom reigns in this place. And the Spirit of the Lord is here to set his people free. So Holy Spirit, we invite you to come and to move in each one of our hearts during this teaching time this evening. And later as we pray, Holy Spirit, we know you'll be faithful to do a wonderful work in us. Father, right now I pray, Lord, that every heart may be attentive. Lord, I pray against all distraction, Lord God. And I pray, Lord, that our hearts would be focused on the living Christ, Lord, in the words that he wants to speak to us tonight through me as his servant, Lord God. I pray, Father, that nothing will fail of everything that's on your heart to do in this time tonight. And I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. All right, uh, let's talk first, and, and I know some of these subjects may not sound very cheery on a lovely spring evening, but uh, let's talk first about understanding demonization, understanding demonization. What does it mean to be demonized? That simply means that there are one or more demonic spirits at work in a person's life. Why do we not use the term possessed? Why not use the term possessed? Well, the normal Greek New Testament word for demonic activity in a person's life is this big word, daimonizomai. Isn't that fun to say? You don't want to experience it, but it is fun to say it. Daimonizomai simply means being demonized, being energized by a demon or having a demon. If you read old Bibles like the King James Bible, the King James Bible would usually translate that by saying possessed with demons. But the New Testament doesn't teach that demons own people. It says that people are demonized or they have a demon. The reason we can get confused about this is because in the older English of, of the Elizabethan era, now the King James, if you read the King James, that's great. I read it too. But recognize that the English of the King James Bible is 400 years old. So in the English of that day, if I said, he is possessed with demons, that simply meant he has demons. That's all that that meant. So in olden times, they would say things like, Jonathan is possessed of great wealth. Now that doesn't mean that, uh, that Jonathan was owned by his wealth. It means that he has wealth, not that the wealth has him. So I want to suggest to you that the common concepts that people have in their minds about demonic possession sometimes have more to do with Hollywood than they do with the Bible. Uh, there is uh, almost no person who cannot be delivered from the control of demons, and people are not possessed by demons. But I will say this, that Christians must wake up to the reality of spiritual warfare. Christians must awaken to the reality of spiritual warfare. Christians cannot be possessed, but they can be influenced or afflicted by demonic spirits. Here's where we get into trouble. We have to realize that although there is protection in Christ, that protection is found in Christ. Should I say that again? There's protection in Christ, but that protection is in Christ. Sin and occultic practices give the enemy a foothold in your life. They give him a place. If you can remember your history on D-Day, the Allies invaded the beach there in France, and what did they have? They had a foothold. They were able to secure a base of operations, a little strip of land on that beach, and use that 
to spring off that little ground, little bit of ground and complete their invasion. And sin and occultic practices give the enemy that type of a foothold in your life. The Bible says it gives him space. Sin and occultic practices give the devil a legal right to operate in your life. Paul tells us in Romans 6, 16, he says, when you present yourself as a servant to obey someone, you are that person's servant to obey him. When you present yourself as a servant to obey someone, you are his servant to obey him. I want you to think with me about this, that the New Testament gives us warnings which make no sense whatsoever unless the enemy can actually hurt us. We need to realize that we're in a real war with a real enemy. The Bible says, be sensible and vigilant because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion seeking someone he may devour. 1 Peter 5.8. But despite those warnings, those of us who live in materialistic societies like our own, we make some dangerous mistakes about the spiritual world. First, we act as if the, the enemy is not real. We act as if he isn't even real. But the Bible says that the devil and his demons are real and that they are powerful. They are capable. Second, we act as if demons cannot affect us. But the Bible says to walk carefully, as we just saw, because the enemy is looking to pick off somebody from the herd. Now, we've all watched those nature shows, right? And I love to give this example. You know how those nature shows work, right? You're watching the, the plains of the Serengeti, and all of a sudden the announcer says, but notice that the baby gazelle has wandered away from the herd. <laughs> that's the precise image. That's the precise image that Peter gives us in 1 Peter 5. The devil is seeking someone whom he can devour. Is he going to go after some giant wildebeest that can knock him silly? Or is he going to go after someone who's sickly and weak and is straying away from the herd? Think about it. Third mistake we make is we do things that give the enemy the right to work in our lives. God strongly condemns occultic activity, not only because it's an offense to him, but because it opens a door to the enemy's work in our lives. For example, if you play with a Ouija board, or if you read a horoscope, then you have voluntarily sought information or guidance from a demonic spirit. To seek power or guidance from demons is to invite them to work in your life. It gives them the right to become a part of your life. Fourth, we make a mistake when we ignore or when we don't care about the risks of occult activity. I want you to know tonight, in case you hadn't figured it out, that the devil doesn't play fair. And to say that, well, you were just having harmless fun is no protection if you willingly go on to his territory. People say things like, well, pastor, I only just had my fortune told for fun. Well, none of us, I hope, would think that we can ignore the law of gravity, but neither can we ignore the realities and the laws of the spiritual realm. And finally, we hope that the enemy won't bother us if we don't bother him. But I want to tell you that that's wishful thinking, and it's very dangerous. The devil is committed to your destruction, and he doesn't make truces or peace treaties with believers. All right, let's talk about the doorway of uncleanness. How does defilement come? How are people demonized? How do they get themselves into spiritual trouble? Some way it's through the doorway of uncleanness, the door of illicit sexual relationships. Now, because of how he's designed us, and we heard some, a great message on this a few weeks ago, God forbids us to do things that are contrary to nature, that are shameful, or that are self-destructive. Uh, can I tell you tonight that Christians are not prudes, okay? Uh, God is not against sex. God invented sex. How about that? That may mess up your theology a little bit. 
But what God is against is sexual activity outside of marriage. The Bible refers to it as fornications and fornication. And if you read a more modern translation, your Bible may call it sexual immorality. And God's attitude towards sexual sin is simple. He just says, flee fornication. That's very simple. 1 Corinthians 6, 18. See, when God brought the Israelites out of Egypt, he was bringing them out of a degraded pagan world that had unhealthy relationships. People say, why does it have to be so explicit in the Bible when it talks about things that God says he doesn't want us to do? But the pagan world that he was bringing his people out of was extremely degraded, and that's why the Bible specifically listed practices that God considered to be evil so that there could be no doubt. Rape, incest, homosexuality, etc. To understand um, that environment, we have to understand what Egypt was like. I want to tell you tonight that much of the authority structure of life in Egypt, uh, their gods and kings and so forth, was actually built on incest. Most pharaohs were the product of a marriage between brother and sister. And the Egyptians even had gods that were brother and sister. One pharaoh, even a famous pharaoh, even married his daughter. So Egyptian society was built on this kind of thing. Forget the sanitized version of life that you see sometimes if you watch, you know, uh, Charlton Heston and Ten Commandments. It, it, was, it was a lot grittier and nastier than that. So that's the kind of society that God was bringing them out of. And he wanted to establish clear guidelines for good and wholesome personal and family living. And that leads us to a common question people ask. A common question is, are sexual sins worse than other sins? And the short answer to that is yes. Yes, it is. Our sexuality is such an important part of who we are, who God has made us to be, that sexual sins are worse than most other sins. Why is that? Well, the reason is because they damage us at such a very fundamental level, such a basic level of our personality, so much so that... As we know in our day, people can even become confused to the extent of being confused about whether they're male or female. When we commit sexual sin, we harm other people as well. We know this. But even self-gratification hurts other people also and is selfish because it can not only warp our personalities, but it will also create barriers to intimacy and wholesome relationships with our spouses. Let's talk about recognizing and breaking the power of soul ties. Soul ties. See, God also forbids sex outside of marriage because sexual intercourse is a spiritual experience as well as a physical one. Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 6, Do you not know that he who is joined to a harlot is one body with her? Because the two, he says, shall become one flesh. And when men and women come together... In that act of intimacy, a new being is formed, if you will, a one flesh entity of man and woman coming together. And it's a spiritual transaction. God has not designed our souls for a multitude of sex partners. At least two or three of you agree with that. <laughs> and hopefully more. But there's a spiritual connection which takes place in the marriage act, not just a physical one. And what we call a soul tie can be created in which a person's will and heart becomes bound to their sexual partner. In this way, people become emotionally tied to people with whom they've had sexual intercourse in the past. In Genesis 34, you can read the story about how a man named Shechem raped Dinah, committed rape against Dinah, who was the daughter of Jacob. And the Bible says his soul cleaved to her. His soul was knitted to her. And sadly, the modern world is full of stories of obsessive relationships and the bad fruit that comes out of them. I think we all instinctively recognize this phenomenon, even if we don't have always a good uh, name or term to put on it. But popular love songs capitalize on this, right? And we all recognize it. Remember Lionel Richie, right? Stuck on you. <laughs> Got this feeling down deep in my... Aha. Uh -huh. 
got this feeling down deep in my soul that I just can't lose, right? Sometimes it's even more dramatic what a soul tie will drive people to, right? I can't live <laughs> if living is without you. Now, you'll sing along in your car, but it's, it's pathetic and frightening. Think about it. Soul ties can lead to obsession and they lead to violence. If I can't have her, frightening, frightening. And there are other unhealthy soul ties as well that impact human relationships besides sexual soul ties. There are other kinds of unhealthy soul ties. Some people become excessively devoted to particular relationships that they have. There are codependent friendships. There are parent-child relationships that go way beyond the bounds of what is emotionally healthy and wholesome. The tie between parent and child is a good thing, but sometimes it gets extremely out of balance and it, it cripples the formation of a person's character. Those soul ties can create a doorway for the enemy's work. Unhealthy human relationships, even if they're not sexual relationships, can breed fear, grief, manipulation, control, and all kinds of things. They keep people Im immature. What do we say sometimes about people? We say, well, that guy needs to cut the aprons, apron strings, right? That is a vivid picture of a spiritual reality that is, that is really at work in a person's life, that they are not able to cut all of the ties that should be cut in their lives when they come to adulthood. I want to suggest to you that a healthy soul has healthy interactions with other people. Why? Because a healthy soul seeks to draw its life from the Lord and not from other people. I think this is why we, we even use the words that we do. We say sometimes that people, that unhealthy people are draining. They drain us. Why? Because they are trying to draw the life, the life force and vitality out of us instead of from where they're supposed to draw it. All right. If that wasn't cheery enough for you, let's talk about the doorway of the occult tonight uh, for just a few moments. All right. The word occult, if you don't know what that word means, it comes from a Latin word that means hidden, and the occult refers to hidden or forbidden knowledge and practices. We need to know that God forbids us to worship other gods or to seek supernatural power or knowledge from any source other than him. And I want to tell you that the devil is very happy to oblige people who don't stay in God's pasture. The Bible is clear. Deuteronomy 18, it says, Let no one be found among you who sacrifices his son or daughter in the fire, who practices divination or sorcery, interprets omens, engages in witchcraft or casts spells, or who is a medium or spiritist or who consults the dead. Anyone who does these things, it says, is detestable to the Lord. People who contact supernatural beings other than God or who seek supernatural knowledge apart from God are easily ensnared by demonic spirits who will deceive and afflict them. And deception can be even worse than affliction because one of the dangerous things, of course, about deception is that people who are deceived don't know they're deceived. That's what makes deception so deceiving, if you follow me. <laughs> and let me tell you also, because this is, this is so big in our society, that this also applies to attempts by people to develop psychic abilities. Even if we have powers that are dormant within us somehow, we are never encouraged by God to develop powers that supposedly exist inside of us. Never. I want to tell you that apart from Christ, people would, of course, even lack the maturity to use those powers even if they did exist. People who seek to develop psychic abilities, so-called psychic abilities, are likely to quickly become demonized. You will notice that so-called psychics will very quickly and in almost all cases deny the uniqueness of Jesus Christ and deny his blood, deny his work. There are many different kinds of spiritual dangers that expose people to demonic influence and that can create demonic strongholds in their lives. It's not possible to give you a complete list, but in general, the Bible counsels us not to do anything that we cannot do to the glory of God. 
So ask yourself these two important questions and they will always help you. Question number one, what is the biblical basis for this activity? What is the biblical basis for this activity? If you're doing something and you think it's good, but every place in the Bible where it happened, it was bad, you need to reassess. And if something is questionable, why would you do it? Question number two, who or what is being glorified by this activity? Can you do it to the glory of God? And I mean the God of the Bible. The question is not whether what you're doing makes you feel good or whether it trims your hips and thighs. Neither is the question whether something works, quote unquote. The fact that something works does not mean that it's from God. Not everything that is supernatural is from God or is holy. Some of it is dangerous and even destructive. Let's talk about idolatry. Idolatry is the sin of worshiping anything other than the true God. The club of God is a very exclusive club. It only has the one member. Uh, and in order to avoid idolatry, we need to understand who God is. Well, here's our dilemma. Our problem is that all we can know about God is what God has chosen to tell us about himself. Right? Doesn't the Bible tell us that we cannot, by searching, find out God? Why? Because he's as high above us as the heavens are above the earth. None of us is smart enough to figure out God. So all we can know about him is what he graciously chooses to reveal to humankind about himself. And therefore, we really need to study the word of God. You really need to know what the word of God says. If you know the Bible then you know that the God of the Bible first is a God who created all things. He's the creator of everything. He calls himself the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He exists in three eternal persons, the Father, the Son, who is the Lord Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit. And also the Bible teaches us that Jesus became incarnate. He became a man and he took on flesh in order to die to redeem us back to God. Now, any religion that is not in agreement with those points is idolatrous. Why? Because it is not worshiping God as God has revealed himself. It is not worshiping God as God knows himself to be. Do you follow me? The revelation of God is what we must follow. So idolatrous religions would include Buddhism, Hinduism, Islam, paganism, and so forth. I think the only exception to that would be Jews. I don't think you can call Jewish people idol worshipers, uh, strictly speaking, be, even though they don't accept Jesus Christ, because their prayers at least are directed to the one true God, although they are not worshiping him, Paul said, according to knowledge. But it's important we know that Paul said, the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they are sacrificing to demons and not to God. Now, that may not be very politically correct, but it's very truly correct. And idolatry is not simply mental belief, but it includes participating in the prayers, worship, and ceremonies of such religions. Idolatrous praying would also include supposedly Christian prayers that are made to Mary, the mother of Jesus, made to angels, and made to deceased so-called saints. Those prayers deny to God the glory that belongs to him alone. The Bible says, first of all, that all believers are saints. And second, it says that there is just one mediator between God and man, and that is the man, Christ Jesus. We also need to know that it's dangerous to participate in groups that have an unbiblical view of who Jesus is. That includes Christian science, Mormonism. Can I say something about Mormonism? The Mormon Jesus is not the Jesus of Scripture. He is another Jesus. The Mormon gospel is not the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. So uh, I don't know if that bothers you, if that is unfriendly or not ecumenical enough for you, but in the Mormon religion, Jesus and Lucifer are brothers. In the Mormon religion, White people are white because they are good and they chose to follow God before they were incarnated. And dark-skinned people in Mormonism are bad because they chose not to follow God 
in the pre-incarnate existence. Mormonism also teaches that you will become a god yourself if you're a faithful Mormon, and someday you'll have your own planet to be the, the god, to be the atom over that planet. God forbid. Well, yeah, God forbid that, but God... <laughs> We've made a mess of this planet. We don't need to, we don't need to so start on any of the surrounding galaxies. But God forbid, that doesn't mean that, that we hate Mormons or something like that. But God forbid that you accept that as any, anything that even resembles the blessed gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jehovah's Witnesses. Jehovah's Witnesses are not Christians. Unitarianism is related. Freemasons, don't have a lot of time to talk about that tonight, but pick up that, that book uh, that I mentioned that will help you. And various New Age groups. The Jesus that is sometimes admired by New Agers is not the Jesus of Scripture. The Jesus of New Agers was the Christ for back then, but they believe that there's coming a new Christ who will be a new world teacher for the New Age. What do you think New Age means anyway? In their thinking, Christ is not a person, it's an anointing that came on Jesus for a time and left him when he was crucified. And that Christ anointing or Christ consciousness is going to come on some future world teacher who will be the final Christ and lead us all to Godhood. Well, there is a Bible character that sounds like that, but it's not Jesus Christ. And many of these groups have ceremonies where they bind themselves under hideous curses and where they pray to beings which are not the God of the Bible. Listen, there is always a good and quick barometer that you can use to assess quickly any group, the spiritual health of any group on this matter. In general, cults attack the person of Christ, who he is, or the work of Christ, what he did. In John, 1 John 4, 3, it says, Every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. That doesn't just mean that they say, yes, I believe Jesus came in the flesh. It means that they hold to all the scriptural doctrine about Jesus Christ. Always focus on those two things. Who is Jesus and what did he do? All right, the, I read the word divination before when I was reading from Deuteronomy 18. Let's talk about divination. Divination is obtaining knowledge by supernatural means that God has forbidden. Divination practices include astral projection, which if you don't know what that is, that's causing your soul to travel outside of your body. Fortune telling, which can take a lot of different forms such as Ouija boards, tarot cards, palm reading, and astrology or horoscopes. Do not read your horrible scope. <laughs> I see people who profess Jesus Christ, and I'm, I'm sure it's probably out of ignorance, but I see people who profess Christ as their Savior posting their horoscope on Facebook. So if that's you and you haven't heard from me yet, you will. <laughs> but listen, don't embarrass, don't embarrass people publicly on those things, you know. Uh, if, you have some, if you think you have good counsel to give to somebody. Um, there's also um, the... Uh, divining act of dowsing, which is sometimes called water witching. If you don't know what that is, that's the, the process of using a rod or a stick to find water that's under the ground. And that's, if you're not in the building trade, you may not know that this, this is actually very common. And uh, many properties all over the country and even in the Northeast where we're so sophisticated, do you know that water is, is spotted and wells dug in many places uh, all over the United States and other countries based on water witching or dowsing. You can hire people to come and some people are good at it. They have the gift. They know how to spot where the water is on your property. Uh, interp interpretation of omens, that's kind of old school but it's still done. Automatic trance writing. Automatic trance writing. Sometimes people will go into a trance and they will just write things out. They'll have knowledge. If you heard of people like Edgar Casey, right? Edgar Casey would have visions and give instructions and things in a trance. Uh, there is a very popular book that was sold years ago. It's still a little bit popular, but it was very popular a few decades ago uh, called God Calling. Uh, I don't know if you've any of you have heard of that book. That is not a Christian book. It was produced by automatic trance writing. If you have it, chuck it. And then we have mediumship. 
Deuteronomy 18 mentioned mediums. That is a uh, large category, which is usually known today as channeling. All right, so channeling, you, you see these people on TV. It involves uh, being a medium, uh, seeking a medium or a channeling uh, person, a channel. Involves using the services of another person in order to speak with spirits. So that includes things like seances or otherwise seeking to contact the dead, uh, conversing with ghosts, uh, psychic readings, uh, communicating with your angels and, and so forth. Angels is kind of a big cottage industry, right? Uh, Satan can reveal information. He can give guidance and steer your future in a limited way through his servants, whether human or demonic. And he often does this through what are called familiar spirits, familiar spirits. Using familiar spirits to reveal information to people and guide them is a counterfeit. It's a counterfeit of the Holy Spirit's gifts of prophecy and word of knowledge. Let me explain to you the dynamic of a familiar spirit and how cruel the devil is in deceiving people with them. You know that many, if not most, fortune tellers are complete, uh, complete fraud, a complete sham, but some of them are real. Some of them do have demonic power, and some of them can, in fact, tell you details about your life. How do they do it? They do it through familiar spirits. The devil doesn't know everything. I hope you know that. The devil doesn't read your mind. The devil doesn't know everything that there is to be known. Only God is omniscient. Only God knows everything. Now, if you go to a fortune teller, a real one, you know there will be some demonic spirits following you who have been in your family for years or generations, and they know all about you because they've been observing you. So when you go to the fortune teller's tent, the demonic spirit that's following you around, if you're so foolish to go, will communicate to the demons that this medium or witch has and communicate those details to her. So when you see these people, oh, I see your grandfather. He had a big red beard and he used to wear too much Old Spice. <gasps> yes, that's him, you know. But if you watch the people, it's very cruel because you see people's reactions. People go to these people and they have legitimate, real spiritual experiences. They are having real experiences and there is real information that is being transmitted, but it is not from God. God says not to even seek to consult the dead. These are demonic counterfeits. We've known people, I've known people that have had the experience of being visited by what is supposedly, uh, you know, the ghost uh, of a deceased loved one. Someone dies and in that, in that tremendous grief they see uh, their lost loved one. And I had a lady say to me, but I know it was him because he came and he sat on my bed and he used to talk, he talked to me about uh, the things that we used to do when we were young and we were newly married. The devil is very cruel. That is not a real experience. The Bible says it is appointed to men to die once and after that, the judgment. When you die, you do not float around here for a month or a year to see if everybody's okay. Let me check in on Sasha. You know, that, that does not happen. And I, I'm trying to make light because everything here tonight is very heavy, right? But, but listen, the devil, think of how cruel the devil is to suck people into that. And, and that will always lead to a, uh, a doctrinal false hope. False hope and it will lead to false doctrine being salted into their lives. There are no ghosts, but there are cruel counterfeits. Okay, witchcraft and sorcery. Um, put your thinking cap on with me here because uh, I want you to see some interesting things that maybe you hadn't thought of from the, from the word. According to Galatians 5, witchcraft, or what maybe I'll call basic level witchcraft, is a work of the flesh like any other work of the flesh. In Galatians chapter 5, Paul talks about the fruit of the spirit, but he contrasts it to this very ugly list of 19 works of the flesh that come before the fruit of the spirit. And interestingly, part of that work of the flesh is witchcraft. Now, it's not flattering to us, but what does that mean? It means that we all have a sinful desire, a tendency in our fallen human nature to manipulate, to intimidate, and to seek to control people and control situations. 
women are usually more susceptible to this particular type of sin than men. Why? Because it's usually, or often at any rate, necessary for women to compensate for the greater aggression and physical strength that men typically have. Um, so it's a, it's a compensation mechanism, if you will. And um, I want to say to you, though, that seeking to manipulate people, however you do it, or intimidate people and control people is dangerous. If you practice that fleshly level of witchcraft often enough, it will become a stronghold in your life that will become demonically energized. That is how carnality leads to demonization. I want to teach you something important and sobering here. Carnality will eventually lead to demonization. By carnality, I don't just mean sexual lusts, although that could be a part of it, but I mean any sin that you indulge. The more you practice that kind of witchcraft or lust or anger, the more that you will attract spirits of witchcraft or lust or anger. They're drawn to it like flies. Those spirits will then seek to drive you to do what they would like to do. And they will drive you, seek to drive you to cooperate with them. When that happens, a sin problem becomes more serious because now a demonic stronghold has been created in addition to the thought holds of, of thinking and carnal behavior that already existed in the person. So let me give you an example of how this works because in witchcraft it's easy to understand. Take it back to the area of witchcraft. If you have ever met someone that is a master manipulator, do you know anybody like that? Or someone who is a, a charmer or someone who has the ability to intimidate people beyond what their age or size or sex might suggest is possible, then you have probably met someone whose normal human tendency to use witchcraft has become demonically empowered. Right? You've probably all known people who were five foot nothing who could intimidate their son or their spouse or their friend or whatever who was 6'4", 220. There is no reason for that to happen in the natural realm. But in the realm of the soul, in the realm of the spirit, it's very possible indeed. And it's also possible, obviously, to operate in witchcraft at an even deeper level by seeking demonic assistance. In what we call supernatural witchcraft, people seek to influence others or affect places and events using objects, using spells, chants, and curses. Those things work through uh, the mechanism of summoning demons and through demonic assignments. A demonic assignment is the enemy's counterfeit of prayer. It's the enemy's counterfeit of intercessory prayer. It's human beings seeking to send out demons and direct them to accomplish particular purposes. Sorcery, which is the word pharmakia in the Bible, that's where we get our words pharmacy and pharmacist from, that is the use of potions and drugs to do evil, to practice witchcraft. Mind-altering drugs, as we've heard, have been used since ancient times in order to override something. What are, they, what are drugs used to override? They're used to override your soul's normal protection, the normal protection that human beings have against unwanted intrusions by the spirit realm. Let me say that again. Mind-altering drugs are used to override your soul's normal protection against the spirit realm. And in that way, by using drugs, people can more easily experience the hidden realities of the spiritual realm. After the fall of man, God, for the most part, very graciously protected us from interaction with the demonic realm. So your senses are no longer capable of easily discerning demonic spirits or angels, generally speaking. Your dog probably can see them, but, but you can't. Neither can demons interact with you as easily as they would probably like to, unless they have some special permission or right to. However, drugs... Sorcery is a shortcut to seeing and interacting with the demonic realm. It is something which might otherwise take people years of training to do. If you want to uh, develop a capability to see the Hindu gods, right? 
You could go fly to India and become part of an ashram, become part of a community in India, and you could meditate and go all th through all these severe physical disciplines for 20 years, and guess what? You'll see them. Or you could take LSD, and you could see them before we leave here tonight. <laughs> but I want, I want you to know, I want you to know that it is not just something that your mind has imagined because you saw a cartoon, you know, when you were eight years old, so that's why you're seeing crazy things when you take a hallucinogenic drug. You may very well be seeing a real uh, demonic being, something that is real. Do not take mind-altering or hallucinogenic drugs. Under these categories of witchcraft and sorcery come things such as black magic and so-called white magic. It's, it's all bad, so forget you know, the category black magic, white magic. Uh, manipulation and control by cult leaders. How do these cult leaders have such power that they can speak to people and command them to take their own lives and do all these horrible things and they do them? Using objects like amulets or jewelry to cast spells and sacrifices of animals as well as human sacrifices. As Christians, we should not be naive about things or about places which have been dedicated to the enemy or which have been used for witchcraft or for false worship. Besides harassing people, demons do attach themselves to places, to animals, and to objects. Right? So, um, is there such a thing as a, as a haunted house? Well, maybe not completely in the Hollywood sense, but yeah, there could be, and your spirit can sense that. I always tell people, think, think of how you react to things. Say, well, I don't like going to that place because that place gives me the creeps. Yeah, well, what is that? What is it when you say that gives me the creeps? What are you sensing? You are sensing the presence of evil there. But because there is no evil that floats around in the air as an abstract force, right? right? Forget Star Wars. It's polluted the minds of, of Christians and all young people when it comes to this. So people think of Yoda. Oh, do not go there. A place of evil it is. But there is no just free-floating evil that's out there in the atmosphere. So if you're sensing the presence of evil, your spirit, by the Holy Spirit within you, you are sensing the presence of demonic spirits in a certain place or around a certain person. That it's like, ooh, there's something about that place that I don't like. Um, demons attach themselves to places, to animals, to objects. If somebody gives you a dog, you better pray over that dog. <laughs> Laugh if you want to. I'm not. Idols, artwork, and jewelry can carry demonic power. Scripture warns you, do not bring an accursed thing into your house, lest you become an accursed thing like it. Joshua 6.18. And you can read a lot more about that in that Chuck Pierce book. All right. Let's, let's talk. Uh, we're, we're coming in, starting to come in for a landing, but let's talk about deceptive adaptations deceptive adaptations it's very important to note some of the dangerous practices which are out there but which have been adapted in order to fit the beliefs of our society so these are things that are usually disguised in order to hide their spiritual nature their true spiritual character these things usually get repackaged for people in the western world as a philosophy as an exercise, as a therapy, or as a medical treatment. So many of these are commonly accepted, of course, but these practices are based on a spiritual foundation, and they can lead to demonic bondage. Uh, they include yoga. The postures of yoga are actually postures of worship to Hindu gods. Why do you, I need to greet the sun anyway? If I'm going to greet the sun in the morning, it's going to be the S-O-N, not the S-U-N. The S-U-N the S -U -N is something that the S-O-N spun off his fingertips. And some of the mantras or chants which people do as they practice yoga are actually the names of Hindu gods or even statements, horrible statements, uh, in which you are really uh, speaking spiritual death into yourself. 
And some of you know we have a medical doctor uh, in our congregation who is, is from India. He's a, a Nepalese brother. And he told us that uh, in yoga, one of the things you say about the, the life force, the prana, and, and how they speak about it, one of the things that you speak in, in yoga is you say, literally, what they're saying is, I breathe death into myself. So obviously, as children of life and light, these are not things we should be saying. You should know. Uh, Americans are very naive about this, but you should know that in India, there is actually a movement to take back yeah. yoga for the Hindus. Yeah. Because those Americans are ridiculous. How, can, how do they think they can practice Christian yoga? Yoga is Hinduism. That's what the people in India are saying, you know. And over here, we're like, oh, it's great. Feel the burn, you know. My people are destroyed through lack of knowledge, through, through lack of knowledge. And if you think it's harmless, you're wrong. You can get a lot of injuries in your body and the spiritual injuries. You know that some of these higher forms of yoga are so dangerous that people in India tell you, tell you not to do them because you can go into a psychotic state. Don't tell me I don't know what I'm talking about because I can, I can get you scads of documentation on that. Um, number two, if I didn't lose you all on number one, other practices or therapies that involve manipulating or transferring life energies. Now, these life energies may vary in their names or what they're called from culture to culture, but it would be Kundalini, perhaps, in the context of India, or Chi, or Prana. So disciplines or exercises like this or therapies would include Tai Chi, uh, feng shui. Feng shui, you're arranging your furniture in order to create or allow a more harmonious flow of energy. What energy? That energy, that energy for them is personalized. You are arranging your furniture in order to allow a better flow of demonic spirits into your home if you do that. Traditional Chinese acupuncture, Reiki and some massage therapies, not all, probably. But all of these are based on working with the flow of supposed energies in your body. Acupuncturists believe that there are 72,000 meridians or lines which channel the energy in your body. Even if that is true, how did they know that 4,000 years ago? Who told them? Reiki. In order to advance to higher levels of Reiki, it is known, of course, that you need the help you need a, uh, not, not a ceremony, but you need an event in which a spirit being, a spirit guide, comes alongside you and helps elevate you to that greater level of power and efficiency and ability in Reiki. Do not let Reiki practitioners lay hands on you if you should find yourself in the hospital. We'll, we'll come, we'll get some Christians to come and lay hands on you and anoint you with oil in the name of the Lord, but I don't need any spirit guides to come and seep into my body. See, God has an answer for our healing, and he is not a mere impersonal energy, but he is a living, loving person. Hypnosis and similar therapies that involve suspending the human will or past lives therapy. I'll save you the money. You did not have any past lives. <laughs> and number four, lots of uh, new age or holistic medicinal practices that incorporate these things, and that includes homeopathic medicine, and depending on who your chiropractor is, it may include chiropractic. Very difficult to find a chiropractor who does not incorporate some of these modalities of treatment into their practice. So you must know what your doctor is doing to you and how it supposedly works. You want to be all about science? Find out if your doctor is really all about science or if he or she is bringing these things into their treatments of you. Um, I'll lose another friend or two here. Martial arts, which retain their spiritual component, particularly when it involves manipulating the chi or the ki. When we were kids, we used to think, you know, uh, karate, we did karate, we say, haya, right? It's not haya, it's kiya. And what it involves is the release of ki, the release of that energy to accomplish really some of the paranormal feats that some of those people are able to do. They're able to do, in some cases, things that Western science cannot explain. How are they doing it? They're doing it through spiritual means. Now, that includes traditional karate. If it has that spiritual cast to it, it does not include things that people, don't, don't misunderstand me, this doesn't include things that people made up in their garage, like Tai Bo and things like that, all right? But traditional martial arts, it's a spiritual discipline. 
as much as it is anything else. Participating in ceremonies of occultic or idolatrous groups, especially if you receive objects or prayer or blessings from practitioners. If you do that, if you submit yourself to be blessed by practitioners of these things, then a demonic transference or impartation may take place. Who blesses, the greater or the lesser? All right, so if you submit yourself to be blessed by someone, you are acknowledging that they are a spiritual superior to you and that they have the capacity to bless you and you've come under their shadow or their anointing, whatever it is. I say this not to scare you. I say it to terrify you. All right. Con <laughs> Contact and conversations with aliens. You may think it's crazy, but people do see strange things. But uh, the dirty little secret is that, you know, supposed UFO abductions have been stopped many times by calling on the name of Jesus. So whatever it is people are seeing, it's not from Mars. Maybe from somewhere in the heavens, but it's not from the physical heavens. Ascended masters, spirit guides, power animals, you know, guided imagery. They're telling the kids in school, oh, just visualize your power animal coming and speaking wisdom to you. Yeah. Moms and dads, you better know what's in your curriculum. Yeah. Or talking to supposed angels who do not obey Jesus Christ or who deny who he is and what he did. Transcendental meditation or other forms of meditation that are designed to empty your mind or to bring you to a supposed different level of consciousness. Gaia or nature worship in which the earth or nature is personified and worshiped and honored. Role playing games with occult themes and games in which people assume the identity of another character like Magic the Gathering which is made right over here in Stanford. And Dungeons and Dragons. So that's quite a list. Everybody exhale. Quite a list. But you know, God has a word for all of us this evening. He says, there is a river whose streams will make glad the city of God. And that's the river I want. That's the river I want to drink from. That's the river I want to swim in. The river that I want to flow in. So why would I want to swim in a dirty river? Amen. Elizabeth, you can come back and, if you would. And, um, it's important to know that if you're practicing anything tonight that's spiritually dangerous, or if you're engaged in sexual immorality, God is not condemning you. But he does want you to be free. His word says if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And he wants you to stay free through the power of the Holy Spirit and through the word of God. You know, if you're unsettled about anything that I just talked about in this brief talk, then please know that God is a good God. He is not against healing. Healing is the children's bread. Actually, read it in the Gospels. Jesus actually said it was deliverance that was the children's bread. But either way, it means that it belongs to us and it comes to us from the hands of a good and a loving Father. I want you to hear my heart that God is not against us being in good shape, okay? But he does say that godliness is more profitable to you ultimately than bodily exercise. We need to ask ourselves, what is the benefit that we have gotten from the things we've been practicing? We need to ask what field it is that we're sowing our life into. What would we discover if we compared the amount of time we sow into our appearance and compared that to the amount of time that we sow to the spirit? You may want to argue with me about yoga or acupuncture or Mary or something, but if we examine those things biblically, we will find them to be improper or at the least very questionable. And if it's questionable, why would you do it anyway when God says you have a source of life available to you? God said, my people have committed errors. They've committed a couple of errors. They've forsaken me the fountain of living waters and they've gone and they've dug for themselves other cisterns, other containers of water, which would ultimately become stagnant. Why would you walk away from the river that God's offering you to drink out of something questionable? So I want to ask us all to examine what, what are you doing? Examine it in the light of God's word and be honest with yourself. Be honest with God about your life because he knows already anyway. In cleansing stream, we pray, we say, search me, O God. Search me, O God. Jesus said he'd come to give us abundant life 
And God wants us to choose that life. I want to read to you what he said in Deuteronomy 30. I call heaven and earth to record or to testify today against you. I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. So choose life so that both you and your seed may live, so that you may love the Lord your God and that you may obey his voice and that you may cling to him. What river am I swimming in? If I can't honestly say that I'm flowing in the river, the river of life and blessing that God wants me to have, then I need to take inventory of my life and I need to see if there's anything in my life that is displeasing perhaps to the Lord. I've noticed that sometimes people get aggressive on some of these things and I've noticed that people who cannot let go of spiritually risky practices, they are unable to function very readily in the gifts of the Spirit. They may also have difficulty hearing the Lord's voice. They have difficulty entering into worship. And they may even become skeptical about the work of the Holy Spirit. Church, let's grow up and let's realize that our culture has lied to us. We cannot play at a spiritual salad bar. Do you follow me? We cannot play at a spiritual salad bar. You can't say, well, I'm going to take some from God's table. And I'm going to take some from this table over here because it looks cool. But if Ouija boards work by the power of evil spirits, how much Ouija board is too much? Any. We shouldn't even start. How much cyanide is just a little cyanide, you know? I don't want to find out. If you want God to search you and if you want to choose life, then let's pray now. Let's ask him to reveal to us anything that's offensive to him. And then we'll ask his forgiveness and we'll renounce these things together. Let's ask the Holy Spirit to show us right now if there's anything related to the occult. Let's stand together. Let's ask him to show us if there's anything related to the occult or to sexual immorality perhaps that's creating a foothold for the enemy in our lives. Let's ask him if there's anything unhealthy, if there's an unhealthy soul tie. Maybe there's a relationship that's holding us back spiritually. Calls for courage. But it calls more for a commitment to follow him and love him with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. So come on, let's go to him now. Let's invite the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, come. Holy Spirit, we ask you to come and to move. Lift your hands to him. Turn your face to heaven. Spirit of God, would you come? Would you search us? We say, search me, O God, and know my heart. Ask him to bring to your mind anything that's offensive to God. It might be something I mentioned. It may be something I didn't mention. Is there anything in your heart, anything in your life, anything that you've done with your hands that's hindering his call, that's short-circuiting his power? The abundant life that Jesus died to give us. Let's just take a moment. Let's just be quiet before him for a minute. Just keep asking him to search your heart. Would you pray this with me? Say, Father, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I ask you to forgive me for committing or practicing these things. Now, what I want you to do is I want you to speak them out loud, but just quietly so people around you don't hear it. You could just whisper it maybe into your hand. Just whisper that thing aloud, whatever it is that you want to confess to the Lord tonight so that others others don't hear you. But just speak that thing to him, whatever it is. Just list those things to him. Jesus. Pray with me again. Say, right now, I renounce these things in the name of Jesus. I ask you to cleanse me from all unrighteousness. Heal my spirit my soul and my body from all the effects of any sexual immorality that I've committed. I ask you to break the power of any unhealthy soul ties 
or unhealthy relationships. Bring all my relationships into balance. Help me to live for you. Let me walk in victory over everything I've named to you tonight. Come on, lift your hands again. Say, Father, fill me with your Holy Spirit. I choose your river, your pure and beautiful river. I choose life and not death. I choose blessing and not cursing. In the name of Jesus. Amen and amen. Come on, embrace him. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Let's just sing before we're gonna we're gonna pray about one more thing, but I think we need we need to just take a breath and worship here for a minute. Can we just do that chorus, Lord? I give you my heart and just lift your hands and just worship him together. Let's sing it. Lord, I give you my heart. I give you my soul. We bless you, Lord. Lord, we want to anoint you with our worship, Lord. We give you glory, Jesus. We give you honor and reverence, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for washing your people, Lord. We thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. We're going to move on in just a few moments to a time of question and answers. We have a microphone set up here, and we'll we'll take some questions. Sometimes we do this in cleansing stream. We st we stay for quite a while, so we're prepared to stay quite a while and just respond to any questions that you may have about anything that I've mentioned or maybe some something else related that's on your mind. But we want to pray for one more thing. You know that this Sunday at 7 o'clock we're going to have a surrender service. And we're going to surrender to the Lord all those things that have been hindering us or keeping us captive, mostly by our own invitation. You need to make sure that you're in our services this weekend. And then you need to make sure that you come back on Sunday night and get prepared get rid, get prepared to be rid of any objects that you need to get out of your life and out of your home. We're going to pray right now. We're going to ask the Holy Spirit to help us to go through our homes, our property, and cleanse our lives, cleanse our homes and our properties. We also want you, as I said, get that Chuck Pierce book. It will give you more teaching and testimonies about this particular aspect. So make sure that you get that book, even if you can't pay us for it tonight. We want to get it into your hands. But what should we be looking for in our houses this week? I've given you a list there, but basically I'll just, I'll just talk off it. Basically, you're looking for anything that might be an open doorway for the enemy to work in you. Anything that might give him a legal right to operate in your home. Now that can take a lot of different forms, but here's my quick top 10 list. Occultic books, materials and equipment, Ouija boards or any other item that's used in witchcraft or other occultic practices. If you have books, if you have music from false religions. Second, idols, including artwork, which is not godly. Sometimes we pick up some really strange things that we have in our house from foreign trips or things that people give us when they visit lands that are really sunken down in idol worship. So, But this can also include things that may claim to be Christian, such as paintings of Mary and so-called saints and so forth. Get rid of statues of saints. Get rid of objects that have been blessed but which are not godly. Get rid of anything in your home that blasphemes against God and against the Lord Jesus Christ. Third, and this is very important, soul ties, pictures and reminders of old relationships such as old love letters, jewelry, mementos, pornographic materials of any kind. I hope I don't need to elaborate. You may need to throw out, you may need to chuck your entire computer and certainly anything else that's connected to sexual sin. Music that's ungodly in your home that has evil lyrics or music that inspires lust, music that celebrates drugs and drinking, music that causes you to be depressed. Sometimes people make the excuse that they ignore the lyrics of a song. They say, well, I only like the beat. Don't be foolish. The beat itself can be powerful to drive you to carnality. But I also think that the beat can be captivating precisely so that it can deliver you the message. And can I say about the lyrics, if you would not read the lyrics of a song from this pulpit, why would you want those lyrics in the mind of your kid? 
clothing that you've worn when you did ungodly things or which you wear for sensual purposes in order to entice the opposite sex. Is he going to go there? Yes, he is. <laughs> Ladies, dump, dump your miniskirts. If that's how you landed your guy, guess what? Some other lady has the power to use the same thing to take him away from you. Guys, that goes for you too. If you like to show off your big guns, you're walking in carnality. The Bible talks about even hating the garment that's been defiled by the flesh. All right, moving on. Furniture, which has been used for ungodly purposes. Things that you may have in your possession that have been stolen or which have been used to commit a crime. Horror and slasher type movies as well as other media like horror books, comics, and graphic novels. That includes materials that celebrate and glamorize demonic creatures such as vampires, werewolves, and all this. School children, listen, this is literally, this is literally true. School children are being so taken in by the vampire craze that they are now literally drinking each other's blood. Occult themed figurines, toys and games, and all children's toys that represent the occult, demonic creatures, and gore. Things that would desensitize your kids to violence. Let's pray and ask the Holy Spirit to send us on a mission tonight into our homes. May God give you the grace, listen, to be convinced tonight that you have authority in your home. If you are a child of the kingdom, then you have the authority to enforce the life and the power of the kingdom where you live. If you have a legal right to be where you are, then you have a legal right to enforce the kingdom of God because that is a sphere that you are legally entitled by the laws of man and God to enforce the reality of the kingdom of God. So let's close our eyes again. Repeat this prayer with me if you're willing. Say, Father, Father. forgive me for allowing ungodly things in my home. Father, with you as my witness, I declare that I am taking authority over my home once again in the name of Jesus. Father, open my eyes. Anoint me with your spirit. Now lift up your hands to receive from the Holy Spirit, to receive an anointing. Father, anoint me with your spirit to spot anything that is offensive to you in my home or on my property. Reveal to me any ungodly things which may be in my possession. Bring back to my mind what and where they are. Give me supernatural help as I walk through my home. Send your angels to uncover what needs to be uncovered. Let the gifts of the Holy Spirit be in operation in me. Holy Spirit, help me to cleanse my home. And Father, I give my home back to you now. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Come on, let's sing it one more time. Lord, I give you my heart. Thank you, Lord. Lord, I give you my heart. Puzzle. I think you have to be discerning because I think what we have nowadays is a little more than that. You know, nowadays what we have is very lurid. It's very extremely graphic. Uh, many people are no longer... Um, we could just, can we just kind of like, um, just exit the sanctuary quietly. We'll just help everybody out. Thanks. Um, what we have now is something that's extremely graphic that did not exist in former times. So you have shows now like CSI that are very graphic and they're showing you corpses and all these things. So people get desensitized to the violence, to the depictions of the violence. Then in CSI, you're not only seeing the person's corpse, you're seeing them getting killed, uh, getting sliced and diced 10 different ways, 10 different times from 10 different angles, right? And we're desensitized to this. Now I guarantee you, if CSI or anything like it, and there are other shows like that, right? Um, if CSI was on TV in 1985, you would have thrown up because you were not used to seeing it, but you've been desensitized to the gore. And this has been a, a strategy of the devil for many decades to desensitize people to gore, to extreme violence. Your kids, you, you can't watch one of these Saw movies, right? 
you probably run out of the room if you saw it, but your kid is like, you know, a fourth grade kid, a sixth grade kid, that's, that's like funny to them. So you've got to be careful of that. And this goes back many decades from the time that mass media was developed. When people, I always tell the story, you'll find this interesting, I think, in the early 1930s, they came out with the, the early horror movies, Dracula and Frankenstein. Do you know when Frankenstein came out in 1931, they put warnings on the theater? Like you would put when people ride Space Mountain, don't, don't you know, ride this coaster if you have a bad heart and all this kind of stuff. They posted warnings like that when people went to see Frankenstein. When Frankenstein came out, what is Frankenstein? For us, it's like a kid's Halloween thing, but Frankenstein is a corpse. And when the Frankenstein monster was seen in that movie, people fainted, people passed out. One lady had a miscarriage. Well, but I was and, saying, yeah. But I was wondering was more of the acts of what these people are doing. Like, I had one the other day where it was mothers who killed their children. You know, yeah. um, I like to find out how they cope them, but I just was worried that what these people, the actions yeah. of these people are letting them in mind. Yeah, well, a lot of those people, of course, are demonically driven to do what they do. And myself, I don't want to watch what they did. I don't want to get in their head. I don't want to hear about it. So, you know, David said, I will put no wicked thing before my eyes. I don't want to understand, you know, here's, and it's always like understanding the mind of the serial, serial killer, you know. I don't want to understand the mind of the serial killer. I want to rebuke the mind of the serial killer and have the mind of Christ. So, you know, there's a big difference, I think, between Jessica Fletcher and even the, the documentaries of today, the documentaries of today of that type would pass for horror movies in 1940. You know, look at when people were killed in the movies, right? In the 30s and 40s, it was like, oh, the war movie. Oh, go on without me. <laughs> now, you know that that's not what really happened, but, you know, the desensitization, the glamorization of evil. The, 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 what in literature what's called the anti-hero, that people are fascinated. See, evil has the power to fascinate. And there's people that know. They know all about these people. They know all about Jeffrey Dahmer and this one and that one and the other one. And some of the kids get so twisted by that, they want to act that out. They think that that's cool. And they want to be like all these serial killers and cannibals and whatever else. So, you know, I would, I would stay away. You know, I would stay away from that, you know. Whatsoever things are pure and, and lovely and so forth, think on those things, the Bible says, you know. So, yeah, it would be good if we, if we can use the mic just because, not because I can't hear you, but because uh, we're trying to do rec recording of this. So come quick if you've got Valerie's on the way. So I, This questioning mind has been a part of me my whole life. Uh, so I watched a documentary called Escape Fire about the, the condition of uh, health care in America, which is not good. And they followed this young man who was injured in Iraq or Afghanistan, and he almost died on the um, transport flight from Afghanistan to Germany. And it was because he was so over-medicated. They took him to Walter Reed Medical Center, they detoxed him off all meds, he walked in there in a wheelchair in chronic pain, PSTD, everything and they used integrative holistic care to get him off of what was literally 30 meds for depression and pain using meditation, acupuncture, um, and he walked out of, of Walter Reed with just a cane and hoping to have a life. So I'm, I'm a little, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm struggling with the concept of the acupuncture and some alternative therapies that have been proven to get people off of pain, de uh, medication dependence, and having freedom from that because it, it does work, so um, that's my struggle. Well, as I, as I said, I think the, um, the issue is not always whether something works. The, the deeper question is how does it work? And some of those things do have a scientific basis, but, but some of them don't. Some of them don't have a scientific basis. Like, well, we don't really know how it works, but we're going to keep doing it. And remember, the devil has power to heal also. He can patch you up, and it will come with a price. Um, Part of that is always doctrinal. You will never see people, I think, that go through those therapies come out too much closer to the Lord. You know, Jesus said that in the last days there were going to be um, false prophets and false Christ that would do great signs and wonders. He didn't say they were fake signs and wonders. So the devil does have the ability through the power that he has to make people better. There is also, you read the Gospels, there are spirits of infirmity. So if I have a spirit of infirmity and the spirit of infirmity leaves, I will be better. 
And so from one perspective, you would say, well, that person is healed. Well, was that person really healed? Or did the devil simply withdraw for his own purposes from that person? So you really have to know, it, I think on a, it's very difficult to, to talk about it in the abstract because there's so many different things, I think, as you mentioned, that go into this. And some of those modalities do have a scientific basis, and some of them do not. We have to be extremely careful. You can go back, and I've had even chiropractors tell me this, you can go back and research the very beginnings of chiropractic. The guy who invented chiropractic was you know, as full of demons as a medieval painting. It was all deliberately done to bring the Egyptian religion back into the world. I, I'm not kidding. So, and I've even had chiropractors tell me this and tell me about this person. So you've really got to know when you go to somebody to any kind of alternative therapy, you really got to know what they're doing and you need an understanding of how it works. If somebody tells me that, you know, well, um, you're not feeling any pain because this needle is blocking the transmission of a nerve signal, that's one thing. But there's many other different mechanisms, spiritual mechanisms that people claim uh, for these things. And, and really, think about it. Uh, it could be a biological mechanism, but if that's the case, why do all the same principles apply to arranging my furniture? It's, for them, for the spiritual practitioner, it's all about the manipulating of, of the chi, of a harmonious flow of energy. So that's, you really, we have the burden, especially as Christian people, to know what it is that people are doing to us that are handling our, our bodies. So I hope that's, I hope that's helpful. So. Yeah, Arturo. But c come up if you. Yeah. Uh, yes, I'm sorry. Oh, okay. Speak. <laughs> All right, thank you. Um, yeah, my question, my question is uh, based on uh, more like my mother and my sister, uh, which they believe in, um, you know, uh, not witchcraft per se, but you know, pe they go to people to actually, you know, read the cards and stuff like that. Uh, you know, what can be done, me as a Christian, they, uh, they are Catholics, okay? I'm a Christian, and me as a Christian, what can I do personally, you know, to get them out of that, uh, yeah. you know? Uh, yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, and, and that is witchcraft. Uh, but so simply to say, well, and I'll just throw this out there, simply to say that a person is, is Catholic or a person is whatever religion, that's not necessarily defining their spiritual life. Uh, many Catholic people I know, you know, uh, whether they're from a Spanish background, Italian background, have mixed in this so-called white witchcraft or white magic practices with their Catholicism to create this folk Catholicism that is not maybe what the Pope would like, but on, on, the, on the ground level, that's what's being practiced in, in Italy, in Latin America, in Spain, all these places. So, so it is witchcraft. Just because a person says, I'm Catholic, doesn't mean that they can't be practicing witchcraft. Um, great question about uh, helping people. Um, really, it's, it's love, it's prayers, it's tears, it's, it's patience. I think the way we have to pray is we have to pray for God's grace, for God to make what, what we call space for grace. Uh, the Bible says that, you know, we, we should be praying that, that the enemy would no longer be able to blind the eyes of people so that they can perceive the, the light of the glory of God that, that's in the face of Jesus Christ. So it's an issue of where is their allegiance, but it's also an issue of how the devil has been able to blind them. So we really need to pray that, that the enemy will no longer be able to blind them in, in that way. Uh, the truth of the word of God is powerful. So a loving confrontation using the word of God can cut through, uh, can cut through all of that. And you know, God by his spirit um, is really the only one who can bring them to eternal life. Jesus said, um, you know, nobody can come to me unless the Father draws them. So we need to be praying that the Father will draw people to him and draw people out of those errors by, by the working of his spirit. But prayer can do it. Prayer can do it. So many of us I know in this room come from that kind of a background where we have had family members that did all those kinds of things and God saved us and, you know, can, can save your relatives also. Yeah. I have a question. It's about, well, a TV show. Um, it's called Ancient Aliens. And it's scientists coming up with conclusions that, you know, aliens have come to Earth. And they had one that was especially on, you know, angels being sent down. And it was a lot of really wild 
information. But I mean, like, I mean, how could they come up with something like this to promote it and to try to sell it? It's an actually, what is it? Um, a History Channel's TV series. And it's called Ancient Aliens, and they've they've explored other religions and everything else. And there's and the, one of the people that produces it is like so, so passionate about it, and you know, and he, you know, he believes in God, but he's trying to break down like you know, certain events that happen in the Bible right. as being alien in, um, uh, influenced. Right. Right. I okay. mean, good, good, very good question. Um, how many of you are familiar with this Ancient Aliens phenomenon or concept? So, um, great question. And uh, was there was there something, uh, some strange things going on back in the day? As Matthew's asking, yes. Uh, was it little green men or even big gray men from Mars or somewhere else? Uh, no. Uh, the Bible says that, you know, in, in that time, in the time of Noah and afterwards, that there were giants on the earth uh, in those days. So people argue about what that means, but there were people who were gigantic people uh, who probably, if they really were descended partially from humans and partially from angels, then they had access to the intelligence of angels as well. So a lot of people are being shaken in their faith by seeing these things because they're saying, well, these are things that cannot be explained uh, by, you know, they don't seem to fit with, you know, with what the ancient Egyptians had. They seem much more advanced. So it's very possible that those, those things were very more advanced than we think, but it was not through men from another galaxy. It was through the giants that were there who had physical capabilities and perhaps intellectual capabilities that were far beyond what, what other uh, normal human beings had. So, you know, if you, you see the Israelites coming into the promised land and they're fighting people like Goliath, who's 10 feet tall, and maybe people that are uh, bigger than that. So if you have a guy that's 15 feet tall, uh, you know, he can move some pretty big rocks around. It doesn't mean that he was from the Andromeda galaxy. Uh, I think the Bible has very good answers for those things and, and refers to them. And, you know, God wiped that world out uh, for, its, for its wickedness. And, and I think that the, the biblical explanation uh, of giants really explains the ancient uh, alien craze. And a lot of that is hoax as well. Uh, the leading guy that's been promoting that for 40 years is a guy named Eric Von Doniken, who is a convicted fraudster and, and swindler going way back. You can, you can look him up. So a lot of what's there is just so easily explained by science, but some of it is legitimately odd, and what's legitimately odd, I think, can be explained biblically by giants, not from people from Jupiter. So I hope that's helpful. <laughs> Rafiq? Come on up. If anybody else has a question, just kind of trickle up to the front row there. Well, yeah, Pastor Nick, you said something about the evil eye, so that reminds me to... About what? Can you hear me? You yeah. said something about evil eye. Evil eye. Okay. I don't, I don't remember saying anything oh, okay. about you e said an evil about... eye, but maybe okay. I did. I no, I mean, some, in, right now, anyway. Uh, so that reminds me to uh, talk, ask you a question about the mighty dollar. Uh, I don't know, you have a dollar in your pocket. If you want to tell us something about what's on the front and back of the dollar. About the dollar, okay. Well, some people believe that the, um, you know, the, the great seal of the United States is, is based on uh, an occultic secret society uh, that supposedly was instrumental behind the scenes in, in launching the United States. So uh, short answer is, who knows? <laughs> uh, I don't need to look for evil conspiracies, you know, uh, around the world because I think Christians are having enough time battling what's out in the open without digging into, you know, what's the secrets, uh, you know, that are at work under there. So who knows? Whenever men get together, there are things that they plan and plot. Uh, I'm not completely convinced that America is the result uh, of an occult conspiracy. I like to think that God had a little bit uh, to do with it as, as well, uh, because w with whatever faults and flaws America has had, America has also been greatly used by God in history to bring the gospel of Jesus Christ to the nation. So in, in all these things, brother, in all these things, there is mixture. You know, there are always the tares and wheat growing up alongside, and there were very many godly people that were here in the early days of the nation. And so I don't doubt that there were also opportunists and evil seeds that the enemy was planting in the nation from the beginning as well. But I'm not sure that it's 
always the most profitable thing to, to look into that unless it's affecting what's in front of our noses uh, at the moment. So, Does it have something to do with the Masons? Well, probably. Uh, I mean, that's, you know, there is a long uh, history of Masonic involvement in government. You know, a lot of the buildings, government buildings in the United States were dedicated through Masonic ceremonies. And, you know, we should be leery of those things. We should not participate in those ceremonies. As the Lord leads, the leaders of uh, many regions and cities and states and so forth have prayed uh, to redeem back to God many of these buildings, many properties and lands and so forth from that, from that type of influence. So um, as the Lord makes us aware of things like that, I believe that he will, in his timing, lead his church to deal with it as, as he wills and as, as he chooses. Uh, I'm sure it exists. I'm sure that there are people working out there to produce, uh, you know, different evil outcomes in many different spheres of life. So, but um, I don't want to. I don't want to focus on that. I want to focus on the kingdom of God and pray into that. Um, you know, if um, Paul had the people pray for him, had the Christians pray for him, that a door would be open. For him, And he did say, right, in the book of Acts, that an effective door had been opened. So I know that if Jesus opens a door for us to serve, nobody can shut that door. The gospel, you read in the book of Acts how the word of God grew, how the word of God ran, how it spread, how it multiplied. So are there conspiracies out there? Yeah, probably, probably all around us, but it doesn't have the ability to, defect, to affect what the church of Jesus Christ does. Amen. So let's focus on that. It's good. It makes good, you know, TV. The, the, how did the History Channel go from, you know, talking about history to talking about the Masons and UFOs and, and so forth and Hitler every night? I should call it the Hitler Channel. I don't know. But, okay, somebody else as a, before I ramble too much. Okay. Everything that you were talking about between psychics and mediums and all that, I've done it all. You've gotten me so afraid that I won't even open a fortune cookie anymore after today. <laughs> And I feel like I'm going to ride off on a broomstick by the time I leave here. I'll drive home on a broom. I'm not even kidding. I'm petrified. But I want to know if every prayer that you just made us say, is that good enough? Like, am I okay now? Well, it's... <laughs> I'm uh, serious. I, I say, if, if, you, if you meant it, yes, absolutely. Oh, absolutely. I meant it. Absolutely. I meant it. Absolutely. Okay. So, um, you know... God, the Bible says God hasn't given us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. So we don't have to be afraid. The Bible says that he, is, he has taken us, he's transplanted us out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his beloved son. So if you've renounced those things, now listen, you may need some Christian friends. You may need the help of, of, of people in the church to come alongside you and help you resist. Because it's my experience, and even in my own life, it's my experience that when we renounce those things and we stand against them, the enemy for a season will try to get back at you. He will try to scare you. He will try to come around and give you dreams and so forth in the night. But we resist those things uh, in the name of Jesus. Many people I know, probably many people in this room have had that experience of having night terrors and things. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you, you feel like you're gripped with terror in your bed or you can't breathe or you're paralyzed or things like that. If those things come against you, you just resist them in the name of Jesus. Just even say Jesus' name. Just begin to worship Jesus. Take authority over that thing. Command it to leave your life and your home in the name of Jesus, and it will go. Uh, I'm living proof of that. We don't have time, and, and you, you might some people in here might have nightmares if I tell them everything that I went through. But the Lord brought me through through all of it. And I'm, and I'm here today serving the Lord with, with a pretty decent history of, of, of occult weirdness in my family and from my own life, the devil trying to stamp me with that from the time that I was a kid. But, you know, today, you know, I'm, the Lord is using me so as his servant. So, so okay, just um, not, only does, not only is Jesus capable of exercising that power, he, he does exercise that power on our behalf when we, when we call out to him. Okay. So Jesus said, I give you authority to trample over serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means harm you. So if you have materials, because it sounds like you may have books, you may have strange things, books, whatever objects you may have, 
you know, just start to go through. Go through, even if, you know, if, if, it, if it's a little, if it bugs you a little bit, you know, have a friend come over with you, pray together again, ask the Lord in your home to show you things, and go with your friend, and just go through your books, go through your music, your, music, your belongings, and just ask the Holy Spirit to show you anything that you need to get rid of. Well, my mother, she, when um, she was alive, she was a Catholic, and she had statues of Jesus, statues of Mary. You just mentioned, I think, Mary as being like not something you should have in your home. But I feel so guilty throwing out in a garbage form something that, not just because it came from her, but because it does have some sort of religious attachment to it. So is that, I mean, it's okay to... Discard of my, those things? Yeah, I, I would say, well, I would absolutely get rid of it. And the reason is that um, what God has done for us in Jesus is, is so wonderful that we don't need anything else. In fact, anything else is, it detracts from him and it distracts from him. Okay. I, don't, I don't need Jesus plus Mary or Jesus plus my favorite saint of my birthday. You know, I don't need Jesus plus any. When I, when I add anything to Jesus, I'm actually taking away from him mm. because I'm saying it's got to be Jesus plus St. Dominic or plus, you know, St. Michael and, and all these things. We have no permission at all in Scripture to pray to anybody else except God and that we only do through Jesus Christ. I have no permission to pray to Mary or to even pray to an angel. You know, I can ask God to send his angels, but the Bible says they're his, not mine. You know, angel, go carry my luggage. You know, I have no permission to boss around the angels of God nor even to pray to them. So um, I, I think, you know, it is religious. And the danger of having those things is that, you know, it can work, religious work in your life. And the work of a religious spirit ultimately is to pull us away from the glory, the greatness of the glory of Jesus Christ. The Bible says that, that in all things, uh, Pastor and I were looking at today, Colossians chapter 1, in all things Christ should have the preeminence. He is above all all thrones and powers and dominions and everything that's been created, seen and unseen. Jesus is so incomparably great that Mary, who even said, called God her savior, uh, which means she's not without sin, uh, even Mary is just a, a shadow <laughs> compared to the glory of Jesus Christ. The Bible says when John, in the book of Revelation, when he saw God, he said, he said that heaven and earth, in other words, the whole universe fled away from his face. So how could I how could I insult Jesus by putting another well I'm going to pray to Jesus and you know Saint Anthony also or I'm going to make I lost something so I'm going to make Saint Anthony ashamed, you know, I'm going to take his statue and turn his statue's face to the wall like my aunt used to do. <laughs> you laugh, people do this. You know people do these things. You know, you know how many people there are in the New York metro area? I was not able to sell my house until I buried St. Joseph in my yard. Come on, that is idolatry. And that, because you know that is not the real St. Joseph. Where is the real Joseph? He's in heaven. So you're not praying to him. If you're doing that, you are inviting a demonic power to come and assist you to make money and you're going to have a world of hurt. So great question. But Sasha, you know, reach out to us if, if you need, you know, if you need help there. I might <laughs> make sure you're here Sunday night. <laughs> no, seriously, make sure, you know, we're wrapping up the clean series. Be here, you know, Sunday and then come back Sunday night and, you know, really get rid of it. You can read in the Bible in Acts chapter 19 that, that the people came in, in the city of Ephesus and they brought all of the things, all of the objects that they used for enchantment, fortune telling, whatever, and, they, and it didn't matter how valuable they were. They, they burned them in the fire. The Bible says it was worth 50,000 pieces of silver. So for love and devotion to Jesus, listen, that stuff is all money. It costs money to buy and so forth and even to belong to things. So, you know, be willing to check it all for Jesus and God will bless you. Uh, real quick, um, about um, energy. Um, when I think about the, um, the structure of the obelisk, when, when I see it in Washington, D.C., when I see it in, um, in the St. Paul's Basilica in Rome, when I see it in every town and city in the world, 
not just in the United States. When I, see it, when I go to Kenya and I see it in Nairobi and I see it in Nakuru, when I see it in every city and town and small village, what does that tell me um, as far as the world and what they worship? Well, um, paganism always ends up being, I think, the same anywhere around the world. Um, those obelisks were used in the ancient world for, for pagan worship. There's a particular symbolism about capital rotunda buildings and obelisks and so forth and what they're trying to accomplish by doing that. They're trying to bring forth something into the world from, from out, of the, out of the underworld. So that's what, that's what it's designed. Uh, what it tells me is just what John said in, in, in his first letter that we know that the whole world lies in the power of, of the wicked one. So the world system is still under the control of the enemy and the manifestations of his religion and how he tries to condition people with counterfeits of Christ is going to be the same, is going to be the same everywhere. Um, the obelisk in Rome, you know, is an Egyptian obelisk that's full of horrible, blasphemous, ugly things that we can't even talk about in church. And yet they've, you know, erected it there. So um, it's, those things are always going to come out with the same manifestation because they all harken back to the same counterfeit religion from that developed after the flood. So uh, and that just tells you, like I said, that the whole, the whole world and those things may be used uh, by the enemy to eventually bring forth the one world religion and to condition people to uh, accept the, the eventual Antichrist. Everything that the, that the devil does in the world is designed to defile people's conscience so that they will accept these things. If the devil can defile you through the occult, if he can defile you through sexual immorality, you'll be brought under the power of shame and you will no longer feel that you're able to come and approach God and be cleansed. The dynamic goes all the way back to the garden. Adam, where are you, right? Shame made Adam hide in the bush. And so when the devil defiles your conscience, most people can't break out of that. They can't break out of the shame. And so the only thing to do to satisfy the ache in their heart is to go deeper and deeper into the defilement to find pleasure and momentary relief. That's the mechanism that allows people to eventually go down the spiral. The pastor was sharing about Romans chapter one. Eventually that spiral takes you all the way down to the place where you're without natural affection uh, and so forth. But that, that's the dynamic, the power of defilement and shame and, and forgetting the true God and keep walking away from him and that's where it leads you. So it's interesting as, you, as you're pointing out, I guess that you know, those manifestations kind of crop out the same way all over the place. So, other, other questions? Pastor Nick. Oh, yes, yes. Um, I wanted to ask you a question about yoga. I, I've always been told to stay away from yoga, but I didn't know why until tonight. I was just told that Christians aren't supposed to take yoga. But the more I think about who I am in Christ, and I know who I am in Christ, I don't understand how yoga can affect me. I just look at it as exercise. I mean, I heard what you said, that the chants are chants to Hindu gods, but I don't understand. Yeah, well, um, you know, as, as believers, I mean, God counsels us in the word, obviously, not to follow other gods. And in the Torah, he told the Israelites, he said, don't even take their names into your mouth. So if I am engaging in a practice that is encouraging me to, uh, to somehow help my meditation or help my exercise to repeat to myself horrible phrases or uh, to repeat the names of demonic spirits over and over again, I mean, how in any way can that be wholesome to me? So if, if the yoga, if the yogi gives me a word to say and says, this is your chant, this is your mantra, say this. First of all, you know, how do I know what it is? Second of all, it could be something horrible. Life and death, the Bible says, are in the power of the tongue. Why would I as a Christian, you know, want to repeat, you know, ooga booga, ooga booga, whatever the name of this thing is. Why would I want to speak that over and over again? What possible good could it do me? It could only, it could only do me harm. And um, the positions that people do, I suppose it's admirable from the standpoint of being a contortionist, but, but uh, maybe not. Um, the positions that people do, again, are designed to facilitate the motion 
of the release of energy that they believe is, is in your body. The releasing the awakening and releasing the serpent, Kundalini, the serpent that supposedly is at the base of your spine. And, you know, having your consciousness raised through these different chakras or energy centers in your back. So, first of all, scientifically, it's all rubbish. Secondly, if there is a serpent that is coiled at the base of my, si uh, my spine, I don't want it released. I want it cast out. I don't want it. I don't want its energy. I don't want its ability because it's demonic. And you can read, and I can send you the materials, you can read what happens sometimes to people that practice kundalini yoga. They have psychotic episodes. Some people literally have psychotic breakdowns from doing some of this stuff, and they never get out of it. There's only one way to get out of it, and that's through being delivered through the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So it is extremely deadly. And if the people who invented it say that it is Hinduism, what, what does yoga mean? The word yoga, uh, you know, if you go back far enough, those ancient languages, you know, Sanskrit and Latin, they're actually very much related. Uh, and yoga is just like our English word yoke. It comes from a common root. And yoga means union. And what it means is that yoga, what, what, what is intended by the name yoga is that you come into union with the gods. That is what yoga means, union with the gods. What gods? With the gods of Hinduism, which are demons. So when you're saying, I'm practicing yoga, what you're saying is, I am practicing how I can be more united with the demon spirits of Hinduism. I mean, that's, that's like literally what people are saying. So you research the dangers of, of kundalini yoga, you'll, you'll be terrified. The psychotic episodes, the demonic apparitions, the health breakdowns. So very deadly at many levels. <laughs> Anybody else? I see that hand. question is what about yogi bear but i'm going to i'm going to i'll tell you something it's interesting how through through th it's actually a good question because ken it's it's interesting how through things like that the enemy makes these things culturally acceptable and cute to us so if you went back into the america of 100 years ago nobody even knew what any of these things were Nobody knew what yoga was. Nobody knew what Islam was. Nobody knew what any of these practices were. Nobody was practicing them in America. And nobody even knew what they were, even knew the words and terminology. So we're very uh, familiar with all these things now, and, and we shouldn't be. We, we really shouldn't be, right? We should be abstaining from every appearance of evil. And, and as Paul says, you know, listen, there's a great danger for Christians who are very interested in investigating all these things, investigating evil. If you don't have a specific calling to work in deliverance and to help people out of some of these things, you don't need to be studying it. You don't need to explore. You don't, you don't need to read up about, you know, the 10 things that homosexuals do or the 10 things that, you know, that they do to people in, in Hindu uh, worship services. You know, you don't need to read those things. Paul says it is shameful even to speak of the things that they do in secret. Don't explore them. The Bible counsels us don't be experts, don't be followers and don't be masters or experts of evil but be masters of what is good. So I don't even want to learn about those things and know what they do. I don't want my kids to know. Uh, you know, we, we could all laugh, you know, okay, my grandmother was born in Scotland in 1906, and because of that, she believed that, you know, if a man put his hand on her knee, she would become pregnant. So we can laugh at those things, but you know what? They were also naive about a lot of the right things in those days too and we suffer for that we suffer for what we've become accustomed to in spiritual matters and that's very tragic so let's learn the word let's learn the things of god and not become experts in what is evil so well thank you very much everybody thanks for hanging in there and uh raise the word